Good morning. It's good to see everybody. Today, today we're in Genesis. We're in our series on the beginnings, and today is everyone's favorite part of reading the Bible. It's genealogy day. <laughs> but uh, don't think of it like that, okay? Genealogies, do, they don't have to be dry and boring and confusing. Genealogies are family history, okay? And the family history that we're reading today uh, is our, it's our family history. These are our ancestors. Uh, family history, you know, it can be all sorts of things. It can be funny. It can be fascinating. Sometimes it's painful, disappointing, uh, even kind of terrifying. <laughs> but it's so important. It's so important. Um, I remember when we were in Missions Institute, as we prepared, we were preparing to go uh, overseas to the, to, the, to the field, and there was a former missionary there uh, sharing about how when they were in the village, uh, getting ready to teach through the Bible, teach through Genesis, they mentioned to some of their friends in the tribe about how they would, they're likely just going to breeze through the genealogies, you know, because it's, it's kind of long and boring, and, you know, there's, there's just more interesting things to get to. And he said, he said that people looked at him and they looked sick and shocked, mortified. They're like, why would you do that? Why would you do that? That's family history. This is, this is, this is, <laughs> this is precious stuff. We want to know. The, 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 every child in that tribe knew the names of their grandparents back for generations upon generations, right? They passed on stories and the family history, because they understood, and frankly, most cultures in the world understand this. Throughout human history, that who you are, who you are today, has been shaped. Sometimes memorably, sometimes invisibly, but we are all shaped by the people who have come before us. One of the things that hit me when, when my dad passed um, recently, it hit me like a ton of bricks, was that when he died... The stories in the history of his family, of my grandparents, of him and his sisters, that whole family was lost to us. And uh, it's valuable stuff. Who I am today has been shaped by those who came before me. The radical individualism of American culture would have us believe that no matter where you came from, no matter who your parents are, you can be whatever you want to be, that you can reinvent yourself completely. Um, that you can, by your own willpower, take the book of your family history, rip your pages out, and rewrite the story to be whatever you might want them to be. Here's the sobering truth of what we're going to see in, in, the, in what the Bible teaches today. Our culture only has it half right. See, the Bible tells us, and this is, this is good news, the Bible tells us you can be recreated. You can be reinvented. Your story can be rewritten but you cannot do it yourself. Only God can rewrite your story. And in fact, if left on our own, left, left to ourselves, our family history is prophecy. Our family history is prophecy. So we need to sit up and pay attention to what we can learn from our family history here in Genesis 4, chapters 4 and 5. We need to remember this well. Our family history there's some bad news. There's some really bad news. <laughs> and some incredibly good news. So that's what, that's what we're covering today. It's a lot. It's big picture stuff. Um, we're covering from Genesis 4, 17, all the way to the end of chapter 5. It's a lot. We got a lot of ground to cover. Um, but I'm going to start by reading just, just a part of it. We're going to start here in Genesis chapter 4, verse 17. And I'm just going to read the, the, the first portion here. This is Genesis 4, 17. It says, Cain was intimate with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. Then Cain became the builder of a city, and he named the city Enoch after his son. Irad was born to Enoch. Irad fathered Mahujael. Mahujael fathered Methushael, and Methushael fathered Lamech. That's the hard part of the genealogies too, right? All the names, these weird names. Lamech took two wives for himself, one named Ada and the other named Zillah. 
Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of the nomadic herdsmen. His brother was named Jubal. He was the father of all who played the lyre and the flute. Zillah bore Tubalcain, who made all kinds of bronze and iron tools. And Tubalcain's sister was Naamah. So let's, um, before we go any farther, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word in our language. We thank you that we can come here this morning and in freedom and fellowship with one another, Lord, to meet together. We come to worship you, to honor you, to know you more. And we just pray now that you would teach us by your spirit, teach us through your word. And by all means, Lord, we want to see your son, Jesus. We thank you so much for him, for his life, for the willing sacrifice that he gave on our behalf. Lord, that he is, you are our Lord and our King. You are our hope. And we just thank you for what you're going to do. In his name we pray. Amen. What can we learn from our family history here in Genesis 4 and 5? Well, there's a lot of things I'd like to point out for. Four things, okay? Four things this morning. If you're taking notes, you can write these down. The goodness of God. That's the first thing. The goodness of God. The power of sin. The reign of death. And the hope of faith. Okay, four things. If you're writing you know, right furiously, I'll tell them again. The goodness of God, the power of sin, the reign of death, the hope of faith. Let's go. Four things. The goodness of God. So Cain has a family and builds a city. First of its kind in the Bible, a city. Then Cain's son has a son and on and on until we get to Lamech. Okay, Lamech Lamech's kids are innovators, right? These are, these are the, this is Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and Elon Musk, Okay. <laughs> Um, Jabel invents nomadic shepherding. Jubal invents musical instruments. Tubal Cain develops metallurgy and craft. And, and between, you know, okay, you get the city, and then you got those three things. These four things are, these are four massive pillars in human culture, okay? When, it, when, when God gave the mandate to uh, humanity, to all of humans, to be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth, spread out over all the earth, these things, cities, nomadic shepherding, Music and art, craftsmanship, they've all played a huge role. But there's a weird, there's a tension here. And I don't know if you feel it. I feel it. First of all, I want to show you, I want to show you, these are all good things. These are actually things I think God likes. These are good things. But, but what's really weird is they all come through the line of a really bad guy. And that just seems kind of strange, right? We'll talk about that. First of all, let me show you, these, these are actually good things. These are all good things. First of all, Cain builds a city. A city, and I can't believe I'm saying this, a city is an amazing idea. <laughs> I know how it sounds. I know how it sounds. I don't know if you... What we see today doesn't look amazing. Our family, we lived in a city of over 15 million people there in Manila for two years, okay? Has some of the highest population density on all of planet Earth. I, um, there are tons of things about city cities that I, you know, how do I put this in Christianese? I struggle with, right? Okay. Uh, ask my wife. I think it's, you know, it's, it's hard to think of LA or New York or, or Seattle in a positive light because of all the things we associate with cities. But just know in the Bible, the idea of what a city is, is actually, it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. Uh, cities are the defining mark of government, of law and order. You can laugh. <laughs> cities are the defining mark of government, law and order, and civilization, right? Um, the word civilization comes from a Latin word, civitas, which means city. Literally, civilization means a society made up of cities, okay? In human history, without cities, you don't have civilization, and without civilization, you have anarchy and barbarism, right? The idea of a city is amazing, because in tribalism, in a village, and we saw this firsthand, in tribalism... It's your tribe, it's your clan against the world. <laughs> but in a city, see, a city is a place, ideally, where you can have people from all different people groups, all different peoples who come together and can live together and can work together. A city is a place of refuge and safety. In the Bible, a city is defined by its walls, okay? So it's a pocket of law and order, amid the chaos and violence of the world around. And again, I know that seems foreign to the way we conceive of cities today, but truly in the Bible, that's, that's how it's presented. 
And again, shockingly, God likes the idea of cities. I know, I'm still getting used to the idea. I, I'm still getting used to that. He does. I won't go through all the different references, but the most convincing proof of that is that when God pictures the paradise of heaven for us, you know what it looks like? A city. I'm still making peace with it. <laughs> it's a city. Right? With walls and streets and the throne of God is there. It's the ultimate refuge, the place of true rest and safety and peace. It's where every nation and tribe and people and tongue, everybody, all have trusted in Christ, no matter where they come from, they come together to live together and honor him. Not just one tribe, not just one clan. All peoples have trusted in Jesus. That's what a city is meant to be. A city is a good idea. And it's here to stay, which is why maybe it's surprising that Cain, the worst guy we've seen so far, the Cain of all people, is the first person to build a city. Then Cain has a son, Enoch. Enoch has a son, Erod, and so on down to the guy named Lamech. Lamech has kids, and they, they start those, these three more amazing developments. You got Jabel, Jubal, and Tubal Cain. Some parents do that. I don't know why. Make all your kids' names rhymes. It's like, is that? I don't, I don't know. Anyway. Hebrew scholars say the reason they rhyme is because there's a root behind all of them that, that kind of carries the same meaning. It's produce. These are some productive people here. Jabel, he's the father of nomadic shepherding, okay? Now, this is massive. I don't, I don't know. You, you get to that part in your Bible, and you're like, eh, yeah, whatever. I don't know. Nomadic shepherding, what's the big deal? Listen, this is huge. Um, let me ask you this. How do you cross an ocean? In a boat, okay? You live on an island, you're going to go someplace else. What do you need? You need a boat, you need a ship. How do you cross a desert? How do you cross the world? <laughs> you need a flock of goats and you need a herd of camels, right? That's how you do it. They're your ship. They're your boat. They are uh, your shelter, literally. Like your, the tent you're going to live in is made out of animal skins, um, they carry your supplies. They're your self-propelled food source. They feed off the land and grow. And they're your piggy bank, right? And they, you know, they appreciate over time as they grow because when you get to where you're going, that's what you trade. It's genius. It's genius. Nomadic shepherding. It's a means to enable people to be fruitful and multiply and subdue the world, subdue the earth. And in parts of the world with limited land for growing crops, this idea, this allows people to make full use of places they couldn't really survive otherwise, to multiply and subdue the earth, right? No matter shepherding, big deal. And God, when he chooses the pillars, like the, 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 the patriarchs of his, of his chosen people, his nation, Israel, you know who they are? They're nomadic shepherds, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's a big deal. Important development. Jubal. Music and artistic expression. I don't think I got to sell this one very hard, right? Are you grateful for music, for art? It's a wonderful thing. Now, if Jubal has time for this, <clears throat> people are more than just barely surviving, right? Cultures where you are just barely hanging on the edge, you don't have time to build, you know, to build guitars and learn how to play them, right? You don't take up oil painting in a survival situation, okay? They must be doing pretty well. And when people have the time to put into these sorts of creative things, it makes life richer and sweeter. And you know why? Because God made us in his image. He's creative. And his creativity shows up in his image bearers in what we create. The Bible makes it pretty clear. God likes music. It's truly, it's his invention. And God has ordained praise for himself through, through singing, through music. Another good thing. Brought through the line of Cain. Last thing, real briefly, tubal cane, metallurgy, craftsmanship. Uh, not hard to see why tool making, metal is an important thing, and God apparently likes good craftsmanship. Do you know the first person in the Bible, in the whole Bible, that God said, I have filled that person with my spirit? First person. Anybody know? Right? Bezalel. Like, who's that? Who's Bezalel? Bezalel. This is in Exodus 31.2. God says, look, I have appointed by name Bezalel. <laughs> I have filled him with God's spirit, with wisdom, understanding, and ability in every craft to design artistic works in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut gemstones for mounting, and to carve wood for every work in every craft. And God ordained that the tabernacle and the temple would be filled with beautiful craftsmanship and all sorts of things made of various metals. 
Okay, okay, let's, okay. So what? <laughs> What's all this mean? Why is this here? Some tremendously important things. Well, here's, here's the thing. What do we see here? We see the goodness of God. We see the goodness of God. Here's the thing. All this good stuff, this all came from the line of Cain, right? What's with that? What's with that? Cain was the bad guy, the guy who refused to listen to God. Why should God be blessing him with children? Every child is a gift from the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Gifting, blessing Cain and his line with children and allowing them to multiply throughout the earth. And if all these developments are even remotely positive, why would God give them through Cain's line, the bad guy? Shouldn't, let me just ask, shouldn't all the good stuff, right, in life come to and through the good people and all the bad stuff come to and through the bad people? Is that, it, it, it's, it's incredibly natural and kind of a religious way of thinking, but it's, but it's, it's wrong. <laughs> it's too simplistic. It's the same kind of thinking that's behind the idea that, well, if I do good, right? If I'm kind to someone, if I give to the poor, that means I'm a good person. That's what the Pharisees thought. They thought, well, hey, we do good stuff. Look at our good works. That means we're good people. Or if God has blessed me with wealth or lots of kids or high position, it must mean I'm a good person, right? If God if I am able to do, do good things in the world or God does good things for me, it's because I'm good, right? Is that how it works? Now, Jesus said this. Jesus said, a good man produces good things from his storeroom of good and an evil man produces evil things from his storeroom of evil. Jesus did say that. He did say that. But you know what else Jesus said? No one is good. No one is good except God alone. In absolute terms, nobody's good. We can look around and compare to others. You know, we, we, we look at some people and some people look better or worse, you know, good or bad. And we can tend to think that good comes from us or to us because we're the source of good. Here's the truth. This is the point. This is what we're talking about. All the good you see in the world, all the good, all the good you see in the world comes from God. And even... Even after humanity rebelled, even when people turn their back on God, he has chosen to continue to be good to us. He's chosen to be good even to Cain. He's gracious. He's always been that way. No one can ever say, God's been good to me because I'm good. No, we say God is good to me because he's good. Amen? When Jesus came to earth, he taught his disciples to show grace and love even to our enemies. This is, this is in Matthew 5. It's familiar. He says, you have heard the law that says, love your, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your father in heaven. That's what he's like, right? It's very human. It's very natural to think, ah, these are the good people. I'm going to be good to them. These are the bad people. I'm going to be bad to them. He's like, that's not how your father is. That's not how God is. In that way, you'll be acting as true children of your father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike, right? You know why we, we're to look for ways to bless friend and enemy alike? Because that is exactly what our father in heaven does, and he's been doing that from the beginning. From the beginning. It's not two versions of God. There's not an Old Testament God and a New Testament God. He's been the same way the whole time. Good from the beginning. And the good we see God giving to and through people who've rejected him, even people like Cain, shouldn't confuse us. It shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't bother us. It says more about God than it does about them. He's merciful and gracious, even to people like Cain. Now, we'll see that God also in his justice does not allow evil to go unchecked. We're coming to that, right? We'll, we'll get there soon in chapter six, but it's a mistake to think that God only provides and helps good people and that the bad people of the world are on their own. No, he sends sunshine and rain on us all. Some people, some groups call this common grace, common grace. It's the idea that, you know, if you break your wrist and you go to the hospital and a friendly and skilled surgeon meets with you and helps you out, fixes your wrist, 
um, and does a great job at it, you don't have to be surprised when you find out that surgeon is an atheist. He or she may give no credit to God for his or her abilities, but you know that good gift, it came from God just the same. It came through them, but it came from God just the same. Anywhere you see someone doing good or receiving something good, whether they're trusting in God or not, the only source of good in this world is God. Whether other people recognize that or not, whether they honor God for that or not, we honor God whenever we see good in the world and give him credit for it. Right? Is there good in your life? Have you seen good in your life? It came from God. If it's good, it came from him. Give him the credit for it wherever you see it, wherever it shows up. He's the one behind it. When you read through our family history, some of our family history as humans, we, we see some amazing things. You know, when I was deployed overseas, I got to visit Cairo a couple of times, visit the pyramids twice. It's amazing. It's amazing. Those stones, those stones are so massive. And it's just like they say, you can't slip a single sheet of paper between two stones on that whole thing. It's, it's incredible. It's incredible. But you know what? It's more a testament to God's handiwork than ours, that he could make human beings that could do something like that. I follow a little bit of what Elon Musk is doing with SpaceX and the rockets they're sending up, the satellites they're putting up. Uh, if you follow James Webb Space Telescope, it's amazing. It's amazing what people have done. But what it actually really says is more about God's wisdom than it does ours, that he could make people who, even in our fallen state, are able to do things like that. And not only that, that he is so incredibly patient and gracious towards a race of people who have consistently treated him like an enemy. For generation upon generation, God has continued to bless humanity all across the world with children, with life, with good ideas. It's not a testament to our goodness. It's the tremendous goodness and graciousness of God. When you, you know, when you look at the evil in the world, Joy and I were talking about this last night a little bit. You look at the evil out in the world and just think, how, God, you know, how, how, God, shouldn't you, shouldn't you hate these people? Shouldn't you crush these people? I marvel at his patience, I marvel at his grace, so far beyond what we are capable of. That's the first thing we see here. The first thing we see here, the goodness of God. Here's the second thing. We also see the power of sin, okay? Lest we get too impressed with all that uh, progress, the, uh, the author here, that's God, by the way, takes us immediately to this brief story about the father of all those innovators, Lamech. Because yes, God is showing grace to Cain. Every child is a gift. And for generation after generation, God shows grace to Cain's descendants. And these productive people bring amazing innovations into the world, good things. But while human, humanity is multiplying, here's the question, is the problem of evil shrinking? Does cultural progress, does arts or science or commerce or government do anything to remedy our sin issue? Not a thing. Not a thing. In fact, as humanity multiplies so does evil. Look here in verse 23. Lamech. Lamech, that's the father of all those innovators. It says, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, wives of Lamech. Pay attention to my words, for I killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain is to be avenged seven times over, then for Lamech, it will be 77 times. Let me paraphrase this real quick. I think it's pretty clear, but let me, let me just <laughs> kind of sum up what we're seeing. Lamech, who is the first polygamist, by the way, um, and everywhere you see polygamy in Genesis, it's a complete and utter disaster. It's a corruption of God's plan for marriage. It only brings misery. He innovates that. <clears throat> and then Lamech composes this poetic threat to his two wives. He says, oh, wives of Lamech, listen very carefully to who you're married to. He says, a young man, a lad, a boy, the word here is, it, he's an adolescent at most, he's a teenager, wounded me, bruised me, so I murdered him, took his head off, made an example out of him, because count on it, anyone who harms me in any way, I'll never, ever, ever forgive them. I'll burn their world down, I'll destroy them. You thought Cain was something? I'll show you vengeance. 
This guy kills kids for bruising him. This guy is an egomaniacal monster, a narcissist in the highest degree. Wow, <laughs> what a stark contrast for what seemed like the progress of the human race so far, right? What's the point? What's the point? As humanity multiplies, so does evil. Knowledge, tools, civilization, arts, amazing things. But all that progress doesn't do a thing to touch our real problem. Someone wrote this as a summary statement. All the advances that our technological world has to offer may make our lives easier and longer, but they cannot cure the human spirit. Now, someone might come in at this point and say, well, you know, okay. Maybe we just haven't had enough time. The human race just needs more time and we'll get there. Give it time. And hey, that's Cain's line. That's Cain's line. That's the line of people who came from a guy who doesn't fear God. Bring in some people who brought their kids up in Sunday school, right? Teach, teach people to worship God and then turn them loose. And over time, things will get better. Funny you should say that. Genesis 4.25. We roll back the clock to Adam and Eve and follow their third son. This is Seth. And by the way, if we're taking, we're talking family history this morning. So Cain is at best like an uncle to us. It's like, yeah, no, I don't know. That's Uncle Cain. Seth, Seth, he's in our direct line. So let's pay attention here. Seth, Seth has a son, Enosh. And it's during Enosh's day that people began to call on the name of the Lord. This, this looks hopeful. This looks good, Yes. Right? They worship Yahweh. They worship God. The, there, there's, there's some God fears in this line. Okay? This looks good. So let's follow the family history from those people. Ten generations, 1,650 years of time. Adam to Seth to Enosh to Kenan, all the way to Noah's generation. Where do we end up? Let's just cut to the chase. Flip over to the end of Genesis chapter 5. There in Genesis chapter 6, fifth verse. You find that there, Genesis 6, 5. God tells us how it ends up. He says, human wickedness has spread over all the earth and everything they think or imagine is consistently and totally evil. Same result. Different line, more time, add in some religious devotion. Same result. Humanity as a whole spirals down. The wings come off. And someone might say, you know, yeah, but that's, a, that's a ancient history, right? Surely today we've seen some real progress. You can laugh if you want. You fast forward to modern times. Pattern hasn't changed. Our family history is prophetic. You know, you look at our accomplishments, the printing press, the steam engine, right? We've mastered the transistor. We've, we've touched the surface of the moon. <laughs> we've put, put machines on other planets in our solar system. We've split the atom. We've got global trade networks, global communication networks, global transportation networks. You can go anywhere. You can talk to anyone. Let me show you a chart. I got a chart here. This is a chart that maps for just the last 600 years uh, the technological advancements and how it has accelerated human productivity over time. You start with the printing press and just, and you can just imagine that curve's just going to keep going. It's amazing, right? We're getting better. Let me show you another chart. This is the chart that maps all of the deaths for the last 600 years just in wars. If you look closely, and maybe you can't see it, you actually are more likely to die in a war today, given all our medical advancements and all the different things, you're more likely to die in a war today than a person would at the end of the dark ages. It's the same as it's always been. You know, we put a man on the moon, we've mapped human DNA, we've, we've taught cars to drive themselves. <laughs> And yet violence and abuse and human evil of every kind have continued with us in every century of human existence. Because as humanity multiplies, so does sin. And someone might say, well, ah, you know, the Bible is just kind of cynical. <laughs> you know, they say the definition of insanity is doing the same things over and over again, expecting a different result. How many times do we have to run the experiment? 
How many ways? We've tried every form of human government at this point, right? From anarchy to monarchy, from communist dictatorships to democratic republics, and a whole lot of other ideas. And I'm not saying all those ideas are equal. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a big fan of democracy. But here's the thing even about democracy. If the people want evil, they're going to get it every time. Our family history is prophetic. Humans have never overcome evil on our own. Never have. And to think that someday we will <laughs> takes more faith than I've got. There is good in this world. Make no, no, make, make no mistake. There is good in this world. No doubt about it. But we can't take credit for that. That's God's grace. That's God's grace. No, we humans, our family, we've got a serious problem. The power of sin touches every one of us. And with sin, and this is our third point, and I'm sorry, it's more bad news. With sin comes death. The reign of death. That's our third point. The reign of death. As you read through chapter five, this genealogy from Adam to Noah, what often stands out is the, is the extraordinarily long lives these people lived, right? 930 years, 912 years, 905 years, 962 years. You know who that is? That's Jared. <laughs> Second place. <laughs> Methuselah, just, just, yeah. Long lives. Now, just real briefly, um, th th those, those ages, that sounds far-fetched. I mean, just to people today, it sounds kind of far-fetched. Interestingly enough, to people who study aging, it's not impossible. Uh, it doesn't even have to be, you know, what we might call miraculous in a sense. Uh, I, I won't dive off into the weeds on this too much here. I did a bit of reading about this, just a bit, and that's dangerous. Uh, but I did a bit of reading about human senescence. That's the fancy term for human aging that the researchers use. Uh, biologists have found that there are creatures on planet Earth that don't seem to age at all, or at least age very, very, very slowly. Um, physiologically, biologically, genetically speaking, it's possible for living creatures on this planet to live dramatically long lives. Now, we think of it as like aging is like we wear out, like our body wears out, like our car wears out, but it's not really that right? I'm a still a youngin. I know you remind me all the time. I'm in my 40s and I'm starting, you know, I noticed the grace. I noticed some more in the, in the mirror this morning. That's not because that hair, hair follicle just wore out. It's like, I'm done. You know, enough with the color, right? It's because in our midlife, at, at, at different stages in life, certain genes switch on, other things switch off. It's planned. It's like our body starts saying, you know what? Party's over. <laughs> okay? Time to wind things down. Let's start wrapping this up, right? And those same researchers say the fact that other creatures on Earth don't age because they have different genes says, you know, maybe humans. If those signals in our midlife didn't switch on when they do, well, there's reason to think we could live much, much longer lives. Interesting, interesting. Not the point, though. Because rather than wondering how it is that these people live so long, you know what the author seems to actually be hammering home? The point is, no matter how long they live, everyone dies. Like, you can live 100 years. Maybe, maybe it'd be even possible to live 1,000 years. But we're all the same in the end. Death comes for us all, right? So you read the genealogy, and, and here's, here's a family history. You're born. You have, maybe you have a few kids hopefully live a productive life, and then you die. And that's, and that's how it goes down. You go down the list. And then he died. And then he died. And then he died. And it's bleak. And it's tragic. Right? The power of sin and evil, the reign of death, it's so normal. I say this, and we're like, yeah, yeah, that's the way it is. We're numb to it at this point. Right? We don't even, we don't even bat an eye, of course. Yeah. And then he died. And then he died. And then he died. It's it's shocking. It's tragic. It's terrible. And then he died. And then he died. And this list, it's like this wall of death. And then one name stands out, doesn't it? Enoch. Because he didn't die. Look at Genesis 5.21. Enoch is born, and it says, and this is Genesis 5.21. Enoch was 65 years old when he fathered Methuselah. 
And after the birth of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and fathered other sons and daughters. So Enoch's life lasted 365 years. Enoch walked with God. Then he was not there because God took him. What does that mean? It's cryptic. It's cryptic. Wouldn't, wouldn't we like to know what that looked like? But here's the point. Enoch escaped death. Death didn't take Enoch. God got to him first. God took him. You know what that means? <laughs> There's hope. There's hope. And this is our last point, the hope of faith. The hope of faith. If Enoch didn't die, if God took him, that means, that means this. That means there's life beyond this one. There's more than just this. Death is not the final word. That cycle, the reign of death, that's not all there is. There's a door. <laughs> there's a door back into the garden. And God took Enoch through it. There's a way to return to fellowship with God, the life of Eden. How? Why? It says that Enoch walked with God. What does that mean? Now, it's, it, sometimes it's, it's thought, well, it, you know, it just must mean he was obedient. He walked with God. That means he was, he was obedient. Well, if that's all that it means, uh, I just hate to break it to you. You and I are toast. <laughs> right? Uh, we're doomed. If walking with God was purely obedience, well, let me ask you this. How obedient do you have to be? And don't forget, in our family history is Adam and Eve. And they sinned once, and they were out. How are you doing? <laughs> no, see, Enoch is made of the same stuff as we are. He's a descendant of Adam and Eve just like us. Perfect obedience, it's not in our nature there has to be more going on here. What, what does it mean that Enoch walked with God? Flip over real quick, Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, other end of the Bible. Hebrews 11 is another kind of family history. It's the history of the family of faith. And in Hebrews 11, 5, five and 6, we get to Enoch. Hebrews 11, verse 5. By faith, just cut to the chase, by faith, Enoch was taken away, so he did not experience death. And he was not to be found because God took him away. For prior to his removal, he was approved since he had pleased God. How? How did he, how did he please God? There's only one way. The essential ingredient is faith. Verse 6, now with, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and rewards those who seek him, right? Enoch walked with God by faith. He trusted God. He took God at his word. He not only believed that God existed, but that God was out to bless him. And Enoch, like Abel, who comes right before him in this list, like Abraham, like everyone else, everyone else in that, uh, the history of the family of faith, you know what made them st all stand out? Faith. Faith in a faithful God. Now, here's the beautiful thing about this for you and me today. This is also part of our family history. The hope of faith. See, Enoch, Enoch's in our line. He's in our family history. And if he could walk with God by faith, we can as well. If he could be snatched away from the power of sin and the reign of death, you and I can be as well. Right? Listen, it isn't in our nature to do good. <laughs> History and our own story proves to us that human beings, we are bent, bent away from what is right. And so we have to put our trust in God's goodness instead of our own. Amen? If you remember when we started out, we said that our culture has it half right. We can be changed. We can be recreated. Our story can be rewritten. And this is how God does it. You know, Genesis 5 maybe feels like a strange place to be on a Sunday morning in December. Uh, we're getting into the Christmas season. Shouldn't we be doing like, you know, Christmas messages and, and that sort of thing? This is a Christmas message. You say, this is the weirdest Christmas message I've ever heard. <laughs> this is a Christmas message. Here's why. You know, I love, I love what one author, this is Chad Bird, what he says about genealogies in the Bible. He says, every time you find a genealogy in the Bible, don't skip it. Stop and think, this is here because of Jesus. 
Every Christmas morning, our family reads the Christmas story in Luke. And in Luke 3, we're given Jesus' family history, and it goes all the way back to these same people and works back through Noah, son of Lamech, son of Methuselah, son of Enoch, son of Jared, son of, son of Mahalalil, son of Canaan, son of Enosh, son of Seth, son of Adam, son of God. Jesus, the son of God, came as a man, became a part of the human race, entered into the family story to change it. He came, he lived as a man, but lived out his true nature, fully God, fully man, and he showed us all the goodness, all the goodness of God. Every Christmas, we, we sing songs like Joy to the World. And we know why. Because in Jesus, the cycle of our family history, the curse of sin is broken. Right? The, the, the angels, when they came to the shepherds, they sang, you know, at Jesus' birth, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Because our world, you know, despite all our <laughs> technological progress, people have multiplied, nations rise and fall. We have never seen peace. There's never been anything but an endless cycle of death. And Jesus comes to us and shows us that even as people have multiplied and evil multiplies right along with us, God's grace is greater still. We are coming into the Christmas season. We're celebrating the coming of Christ. Where are you at? Where's your hope? What are you trusting in? Who are you trusting in? Our family history tells us we tend to put our hope and our trust in the wrong things. It's a, it's, it's a kind of insanity, frankly. <laughs> We keep trying the same things over and over and over, expecting a different result. Looking to ourselves, trying to redeem ourselves just by the will, by willpower or whatever. Looking to human wisdom, looking for some innovation, some new idea, some new thing, anything. Turn over a new leaf. Wandering around, grasping again and again and again. There will be no human solutions to your spiritual problems. There will be no technological solutions to your spiritual problems. There will be no political solutions to your spiritual problems. 2024 is around the corner. Let me say it again. There will be no political solutions to our spiritual problems. Art's not going to save us. Your productivity, your diligence, all the good you can muster. If you're here this morning thinking, you know, well, I'm just going to try. I'm just going to try my very best. I'm going to just be as obedient as I can. And hopefully that's good enough for God. I'll just try and try and try again. Read the family history. <laughs> People have tried. Nothing will truly change until you put your hope in Jesus alone. Put your trust fully in his goodness. At the start, we said your story can be re rewritten. You can escape the prophecy of the family history of humanity. We'll close with this. This is John 1, verses 12 to 14. To all who believed in him, that's Jesus. To all who accepted him, Jesus. He gave the right to become children of God. They're re reborn. <laughs> Not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the word, that's Jesus, became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Amen. Can I ask those who are serving communion uh, to prepare for that? Jesus, Jesus became human. Emmanuel, God with us. And everyone who puts their hope in him not only will escape the power of sin, but the reign of death and be put into the family of God, a family of faith. He lived a perfect life, a, a life of perfect faith and obedience to God, the kind of life you and I were made to live but couldn't. Um, <laughs> you know, on earth, Jesus didn't live a thousand years. He lived around 30 <laughs> And he accomplished more lasting good than any other human being ever has. And then he died in our place, 
gave his life to pay for our rebellion against God. He paid for the evil we've done. And everyone who is trusted in Jesus is a new creation, reborn. Hallelujah. We have an open table. If, if you're trusting in Jesus as your Savior, then you are welcome to eat with us this morning. I'm going to pray. The elements are going to be passed out. Just if you hang on to them, wait so that we can uh, take and eat together as a family. Let's pray. Lord, we, we thank you. <laughs> thank you for the unvarnished truth of where we come from, of what our real need is, of what our true problems are. God, thank you for your goodness, your gracious to, to, graciousness to us. Even in our rebellion, even before we knew you, even before we trusted you, you, you were good to us. You were kind to us. We thank you for that, Lord. We marvel at your patience. When we look out in the world and we see what you allow, the, the patience and the grace you show to people who continue to spit in your face, we, we, we marvel at your graciousness, Lord. Thank you for being kind to us. For each of us here, Father, we, we, we do tend to turn back to the same old way of doing things, to give in to that, that same nature that is in each of us, that, that desire to find our own way, to rely on ourselves. Lord, I pray that you would <laughs> make this tr- continue to make this truth real to us. We need you. We need your son. We need his life in us. God, we thank you. Thank you for everything that you have given us, all the good you have given us. And most of all, we thank you for the life of your son. In his name we pray, amen.